Yes. On, on the motion, the South prefers a world where the Indian subcontinent became a united federal state in 1947 over a world where it was partitioned into the sovereign states of India and Pakistan. I welcome Prime Minister here. here. I like to have 30 seconds for the prep for compiling my notes. So I'll start my speech in three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, let's first address the matter or the definitions important in the motion. I'm, I'm sure that everybody has read, uh, read the motion, so I don't need to re reiterate it or reread it for you guys as you are not, not kids. So first of all, let's come to the partition. The action or the state of dividing or being divided into parts is called or known as, uh, uh, known as partition. Second of all, we have the sovereign countries. Sovereign countries specifically, uh, specifically uh, uh, tells us about a united country that was divided into parts and now is united. You could say that like a Khand Bharat or, or, or the subcontinent before the partition existed, that is what is called a sovereign country. Uh, and we would like to describe the stakeholder of this debate and the stakeholder of this debate are specifically people that are living in subcontinent areas and secondly, they are uh, uh, that includes the rest of the world. I will explain you in my debate further that how rest of the world is stakeholder and how they are involved, uh, involved and equally accountable, uh, equally accountable for this motion and for uh, uh, are relevant towards this motion. So first of all, let's explain it by people. So people, of course, they could flourish better if the, uh, if Pakistan and India and all subcontinent was united like it was before partition and by the world because as we have seen that how combined subcontinent was strong enough that it entrusted not only Britishers but all around the world and they were greedy for uh, greedy for the wonders that we ha we could do either in the textile industries or either uh, the, the amount of richness we had or the cultural combinations we had right so we were strong enough that we could self-sustain socially and economically. And we would not have to see partition of Bangladesh or Pakistan or being affiliated or dependent on US or USSR in the very first place. We would have, we would have, we would not have seen US doing atrocities on Afghanistan by, uh, by sharing bases of Pakistan in the very first place. This not only weakened the state of subcontinent, but it also weakened, weakened Asian, uh, Asian continent in the very first place. And uh, the reason Pakistan was affiliated with US for such a long time, it had not only made US stronger in the, all of these years, but it have the weakened, pa uh, weakened Pakistan, uh, weakened Pakistan simultaneously. So it was a uh, symbiotic relationship, as you may, as you may know. So. Uh, secondly, as we all are aware, other countries won't be able to weaken Asia or specifically we could be self-reliant and could live in a better world that we are currently living in, uh, living in at the moment. So first of all, we could have avoided the violence and humanitarian tragedy that, were, that happened in 1947 that resulted in a large mass migration in the human history with an estimated of 10 to 15 million people that displaced over the million people and killed in communal violences. The, uh, the division of the subcontinent along the religious lines intensifies communal tension and led to widespread of the violence, particularly in Punjab and Bengal, right? So a united federal state would have likely avoided the catastrophic uh, uh, human tragedy by maintaining the territorial integrity of the subcontinent, preventing the forced migration of the million of peoples. Why and what are the impacts? Of course, the impacts matter. The subcontinent could have spared itself the immense loss of life and deep scarred the communal hatred and continue the effect of India and Pakistan. The humanitarian crisis of 1947 would have been avoided. Let's not forget, not right now, let's not forget that subcontinent coexisted with different religions and with all the religions and sexualities before Britishers came in. So it could have, it could have also built tolerance 
and that is what the job of government should have been in order to make people coexist and co uh, uh, coexist in the same place. Second of all, Austria is a strong and more diverse nation. So United Federal State would have allowed Indian subcontinent to maintain its rich cultural, religious and linguistic diversity in the single political entity. Federalism could have been provided a framework with the religion autonomy and present, uh, representation allowing different communities to coexist while respecting their unique identities. Let me let me tell you clearly that the, one of the main major reasons for religion for the separation of Pakistan and India, and we could easily uh, alter that by creating by uh, by shaking hands, by creating tolerance among people, by telling them yes, if this is offensive, this could happen. We can see examples of Europe that exist that where religions are not that mm -hmm. part of uh, that, that part of the playing field in the very first place, and people are co coexisting in, in 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 the state as well, or we could separate. Uh, separate people in different states like the US does and still could be united uh, united like uh, like subcontinent so preventing long term conflicts between india and pakistan we both we all know that what pakistan and india had faced during the three wars or uh, during the two wars and the pressure the payload the, the loss of blood the uh, uh, wait a minute Achha, the loss of blood nuclear arms race and ongoing conflict over Kashmir, this unresolved territorial disputes and deep-seated mistrust between India and Pakistan have diverted resources from development and created a constant threat of war, right? A united federal state could have avoided the creation of these hostile nations or preventing of decades of decades of war, right? So economic, and, uh, uh, economic potential or regional development that this united sovereign country could have had if it would, would not have been... Uh, distributed or partitioned in the very first place. So let's not forget that Bangladesh was a part of the subcontinent too. So we had the perfect land for growing self-sustaining crops. We had the perfect land for creating self-sustaining businesses. We had the masses and we could easily see the example of how India is currently advancing in advancing in technology and its economic forums, right? So as United, we could have even gotten to the better heights why? Because it would have been more, um, more reasonable for people to coexist and uh, and help each other out to create a better, a better thing. Why? Because it created competition in the very first place, so people would be able to, uh, uh, pe people would be able to co compete more, and there will be more people in order to create. Uh, like we, as we all know right now, labors in subcontinents are cheaper. That's the reason why companies are coming here, right? So if it, if if it was not a separated country, this would have increased the amount of growth that we could have in the specific areas. A united federal state could have leveraged the economic strength in different regions, promoting industrialization or agriculture or infrastructure development, and of course, and of course, the global influence and geopolitical stability. A united subcontinent would have been one of the most popular, powerful nations in the world with significant influence in the global affairs. The division of India, Pakistan, and later Bangladesh weakened the region geopolitical situation and created a vulnerability. So just imagine that this subcontinent had you the are... power enough to actually make Britain the rich that it is right now. And lastly, it had power enough that it could be uh, be the superpower and defeat all other uh, all other competitors in the space as well. With this, I would like to end my debate. Proud to propose. Great, thanks so much. Um, a reminder to take POIs. A reminder to offer POIs before six minutes. Um, and a reminder to also just not speak for seven minutes, fifteen seconds. Thanks so much. Hello. Hi. Leader of Opposition, um, can I have a few seconds? Yeah, sure. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Thank you. Um, I prefer the per I prefer verbal POIs. From opening, both opening and closing, so just shout whatever. Um, my speech begins in three, two, oh, wait. Trigger warning there'll be some, I don't know, very sensitive contents relating to religion or war in this debate. So 
it's it doesn't represent any of my stances it's just for the sake of engagement okay my speech starts in three two one panel the thing is that religious in inconciliatory religious unaffiliations religious hostility can really cause war one very simple example trigger warning is that you see between israel and palestine the war sparks from them trying to you know tell what what tell what if the jerusalem does really represent their religion they have religion but they have religious hostility. They fight over religious purposes. We believe that it, this applies the same for both India and Pakistan, because basically those um, the majority of Indian and Pakistans believe in their religions. They do everything with their religions, and their religions religions is a main platform for them to grow, for them to survive. A lot of policies nowadays, a lot of politics nowadays in both in both India and Pakistan is based on you know the teachings in the religions and stuff like that. So we believe that the thing that both Pakistan and Indians care about the most is about their religion, whether they're living the purpose of their religion and whether are they protecting or not. In this debate, I'm going to tell you why first. We accept that, yes, there are to some extent people hurt and people died in the migration, but we believe that on our side, the whole on our side of the house, even if it exists, it will be it will be completely better and prevent any civil wars in coming in the future. Second, we prove to you that even on their bed, even on the worst side of the case where people are dying, we believe that Brit the Britain and you know the the migrated uh, the merged the March government will have less incentive to help both of these countries because they simply do not have to share the same interests. So it'll be very harder for Britain to support and to repay them in return, and very harder for those states, which is which is one they merged into one, to really be a good government. Therefore, leading to more civil wars. Okay, coming to our uh, coming to my first. Question. It's about so you know the majority of Indians are. Uh, Hindus and the majority of Palestinians are um, are Muslims, right? We all know that in the status quo, there has been three or more wars between those countries simply because of religions. Imagine merging a country together. The, these countries in 1947, which was freed from Britain, has no foundation at, at all. They're in turmoil, both in economics, both in politi politics, and both in religion. So if we merge those two all, the first thing that they're going to fight about is which one is the most predominant religion. They're going to fight whether their policy, whether their politics, whether their economics should be based on one religion. We all know that in the status quo, they hate each not my people, except if you say that, you know, you would have prevented civil war, why was Bangladesh created after the separation of India and Pakistan? The thing is, it doesn't matter. The thing here is, even if it happens, we'll prevent more civil wars in the future. The thing is, the thing is, because because there is a religious disinterest, because there is religious turmoil, so they're gonna probably gonna fight about which religion is the predominant to them. They're gonna have different interests. They have the conflicts of interest. That's what is the information? No, we, we have proven to you in the, our previous examples that those are going to spark civil wars. There is no unity between people in the country. If there is unity, one, those countries, they are not stable at all in the beginning. Two, those two religions are contradicting each other. If a country born just after a lot of war and colonization, right. how is it not yet? Please do not do not that. How, how are we going to actually have unity, which is the most important thing for both of the governments to actually rise and flourish? So even if, yes, they're displaced people, but we believe that in the status quo, the status quo has proven to you that even when they're separated, they still have wars because of religious interests. So are. even with, you know, when they have religious interests. So when they're merged together, it's going to be worse because basically those people are fighting over over religious interests. We believe that because religion is a predominant thing in this society, so first, they're going to have turmoil in politics. Two, they're willing to do anything to protect their religion and prove that they are more predominant. Three, they simply cannot just live together. We believe that on your side of the house, even if you can save the displaced people, we believe that the long-term impact is more important because we actually save the future generations 
from genocide, from all the from, from all the from civil wars, from disunity, and we'll have and we'll prove to you why on our side of house. First, there are less civil wars because of conflicts from religion. Two, British is pretty. pretty the Britain Empire is more able to uh, is more able to repay to us. One, if we work separately, that means we do not have political turmoil. We do not have conflict turmoil. We do not have to waste time trying to mediate our people. Instead, we can focus on our the demographics of our people, the, what we actually need on our side of the house. What we actually need on our side of the house. So, so we do not have to spend time wasting time doing stuff like re reconciliating people. This is better because first, both of the government can focus on their the, those people needs, avoiding less turmoil. Second, Britain no, will have chance. Yes. As you can see, Pakistan is still having a civil war based upon the religious subdivisions. Means there is a sheer genocide that is going on in pa pa Pakistan. How could you say that? Well, for just the uh, basis of religion, people would not be uh, after getting yes. partition. There would be the a thing, place. Yes, the thing is, there will be more wars because we have proven to you those people care more about religion than anything. Those religion practically doesn't align with each other before even the separation over the colonization. If they stay together, they're gonna fight all day. How does the government even have the resource to rebuild the country if they're spending reconciliating the people all day? Whereas on our, uh, whereas on our side of the house. The government controls um, demographics. The Britain will the Britain will have more incentive because now they now they understand that those people have different needs, so they can allocate accordingly. They do not have to do this, so they will not be you know demotivated by the duty to resolve work or the duty to just actually allocate resources to to a country which is full of war. Whereas on our side of the house, both people in the future generations are going to be happier because first, in the future generations, we do not have economic terms. That we do have not politics turmoil. We are not in con constantly of discrimination between our people, arguing about which one is better. And two, we are more likely to grow because now Britain really understands our needs and give us accordingly. They do not have to wait for the war to settle that or anything like that to provide us. So, in, 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 uh, so at the end of the day, we believe that we win because if we protect the future generations from uh, religious wars and then we allocate those people accordingly after. Uh, great, thanks so much. Again, a reminder to time every other speaker apart from yourself so you will know when it is particular time. Um, great, thanks so much. Uh, Deepya. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you say that sentence again? You were soft in the beginning. Uh, sorry? Okay, you're much louder now. Yep. Okay, uh, is it okay now? Yep, it's good. Okay. Uh, okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. The uh, by f I'll first start by mechanizing how we are going to actually create a state where Hindus and Muslims can live their lives, can live with their own re religious freedom while also living under one federal state. The problem, the thing is, because it's a federal state, doesn't mean that each each uh, separate province or small state cannot have its own independence. We can take the example of America, where we see that Texans and New Yorks and New Yorkers have literally no uh, no uh, relation to each other they hate each other uh, again uh, trigger warning but uh, the texas uh, texas people say g pray the gay away and the new yorkers are uh, are in, uh, are supporting the lgbtq movement these are two sep very separate movements and they're very uh, they're very uh, predominant on their ideas still they uh, when they when the time comes where uh, usa is in trouble all those people unite together even even though they have completely different Point. ideologies now it's now compared that to Pakistan, where uh, no, where uh, now compared that to India, where Hindus and Christians are still living together. They have religious differences. They're living. Uh, they're still living together. South India, and no uh, North India have nothing in common. They're still living together in peace, even though they hate each other. They hate each other. They don't even have the same language. They don't have the same culture. They don't have anything in common. But they're still living in uh, together. Why? Because that is possible. We can see that Why? in India itself. Uh, I'll take the.
that uh, I'll ask when I want the P uh, POI. Uh, so uh, now uh, when I have established that each state can have its own independence, can have its own laws, Muslims can eat uh, cows, while Hindus who, who don't eat cows, who regard them as holy figures, in those states, hey, those states cows could be... Uh, Cow uh, eating could be banned. Cows could be uh, worshipped. So uh, by having a st state law and federal law, where the state uh, can be uh, religious while the fed uh, federal system it can be secular. So it caters to both ideas that even if Muslims and Hindus cannot live together, uh, uh, Muslim and Hindus cannot live together, we can create a system in which Hindus' uh, religious beliefs and their cultural differences can be respected while Muslims' uh, culture beliefs and uh, uh, things can be respected. Another thing, important thing to note is that in this current world, in Pakistan at least, it's said, how many kafirs can you kill before you feel Muslim enough? They In Pakistan, they have uh, declared Ahmadis, those, uh, those are different from uh, Sunnis, as uh, non-Muslims, they have declared Shias and non-Muslims, they have killed Hindus. So at this point, even in the current world, we live in a current world where again, there is still religious extremism. If their argument is that there, there would be there, there is less religious extremism, then they're wrong because right now in Pakistan, the most minorities may be Hindus, Christians, Ahmadis, Shias, any one of them, they're all being undermined, they're all being killed. There's a Shia genocide going on. Ahmadis were kicked out of Pakistan. Hindus are getting killed in sin. So again, in the current world that we live in, that they're proposing, they're still, all the minorities are still getting hurt. And let's important thing to note is that the, our burden is to prove that even if they, even oh, if one less uh, rape happened uh, again trigger warning uh, if one less rape happened if one less person got killed if one less separate family got separated from each other we win this debate because th these are the facts that uh, there is uh, th there was a case where six killed their own wives killed their own children killed their own daughters uh, during the partition why because they they fear that Muslims would uh, Muslim men would rape the rape again to government they would uh, rape them that's why they they killed their own wives so at this point and there were two million deaths so the opposition has to justify that the two million deaths was worth it that uh, uh, partitioning Bangladesh was worth it that the current state of Pakistan where uh, where there is almost a civil war where there's a protest every week and the capital is uh, uh, capital is most uh, most of the days is uh, being held protest and the government is unstable where India where uh, uh, a, a, a PM which is which which has linked to a very extremist party called the RSS is linked to India and in the world that we are currently living in the world that they're proposing in we don't want to live in a world where still extremism exists where a, a person who's related to the RSS can become the president of a secular country we Point. don't want to live in a world where minorities in Pakistan are oppressed we don't want to live in a world where uh, Pakistan's current state is is in a very crucial state we don't we don't have money poor are suffering we are almost in a state of civil war this is the world that they're uh, proposing so even this is like the, the, the these are facts that i'm i'm not giving my opinion now coming on to the world that we are proposing we are proposing a world in which we instead of we, even if there are some we are not expecting that there will be zero culture there will be zero zero religious violence but it will be less why because the partition and it was fueled by leaders like uh, uh, kaide azam and leaders like in, 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 uh, yeah okay uh, i'll take your pi the thing is, if two countries very unstable, has no money, has no economics, they have different backgrounds, different religions, different language, they completely doesn't align with each other. How are you going to enforce diversity or things like that in the beginning? Okay, I, I I gave the example of India, but I'll give it again. The different the thing is in South India and North India, they have completely different languages. In South India, they speak Tamil, they're Christians and Muslims. They are not Hindus, they hate the North Indians. And that is a common thing. In North India, they're Hindus, they speak Hindi and they speak English. They have two different languages, two different religions. If you're if you're saying that Muslims uh, are not peaceful and can't live together, that's a very racist statement because Christians and Hindu can. We have that example in India itself. So if you are giving the racist statement that 
Muslims cannot live with Hindus, then I would completely disagree with that. Muslims can live with that. We have the simple example of uh, Hindus and uh, uh, Hindus and Christians living together. I think Muslims can do that too. So now coming to uh, so uh, now uh, drawing the comparison that in their world uh, uh, they have to justify rape. They have to uh, again trigger warning. They have to just, uh, trigger warning. They have to justify rape. They have to justify killing of women. They have to justify all the two million lives that have been lost. They have to justify the minorities that are being killed right now in Pakistan and have uh, and with all their guts have to say that no, this world is the best and the, the world that we are suggesting in which maybe those cases will happen but because uh, the, the difference because uh, the partition happened because leaders like Nizamuddin, Qaid Azam and Ilham Iqbal who use religion and use that idea that you are different and taught that to those people if those leaders didn't exist and we those people were actually taught that yes, you people can live together you're the same, you're the same blood you know you have the same culture just because you have religion uh, you have a different religion doesn't mean that you can't live together in a world with those ex extremist leaders who uh, who actually exacerbated those ideas and actually uh, actually put fuel on those ideas uh, we have the example of Calcutta killing, killing two where uh, Muslim uh, leaders actually encourage people to uh, make violence so if we don't have those uh, leaders and we actually those leaders actually promote uh, part, uh, uh, unity we would have a world where there is less violence there is less rape there is less uh, the, the overall there is more stability and every culture is still respected because we are living in a state with this state law and federal law and state law can be religious while federal law can be secular thank you thanks so much um just a reminder to cut out the last 25 seconds of that prior speech um just track it for your notes judges great um as always um keep track of each other's time and uh, don't go beyond 715 Hello. Um, okay. Just a few seconds for me to prep my timer. <clears throat> Speech will start in three, two, one. We're seeing many assertive coming from side government because when they try to tell you that, oh, people would be united, but panel note the fact that they're actually debating on the wrong ground because the context that we are debating today is a world in 1947. What did this look like? This looks like in both country when it came to Pakistan or India, when British left them, which is say, this is the, this is the period where each individual, when it came to Pakistan or India, are highly absorbent when it came to um, British ideologies. What a British ideology they're trying to tell two of these people or two of these countries in the first place. We think that A, they're trying to break the unify between two of these two so that they're trying to implement it, the worst stereotype to each other. Like just only that because of different um, religion in the first place. We think that back in time, British, they're so, they wanted to break the unifying between two of these nations in the first place. They wanted to make them hate each other so that when there's anything happened, they couldn't unify together and fight back British in the first place. That is the reason why in that specific places, A, the, the amount of conflicts of two of these nations are A, very high in the first place. But two, they hate each other so much because the ideology that the British gave them in the first place. That is the reason why when they tell you that civil war might actually happen. Yes, we do not uh, we do not disagree, but we think that civil war exists worse in their side of the house. Simply two of these reasons. A, because we think that two of these parties in the first place, when it came to Pakistan, they're having their own stances and there already been civil war before, which means they have different ideology, different opinions, and different interests to fight begin in, in the beginning, in the first place. Place. That is the reason why they're not being together. And when you force two of those countries to unify together, when they have different ideology, when they have different opinions, why is it that in the first place? One, it's... <clears throat> I'm sorry, one, it demolished the political stability. Uh, what is it? Why is it bad in the first place? Because firstly, two of those parties, they will constantly yeah. fight among each other in the first place because they have different opinions and they have different things to uh, different goals in the first place. But second of all, we think that it's worse because most of their resources get fight into two of these parties. Instead of politicians, they're getting uh, invested into the immigration, like what they member. We think that they would like yeah. the mm -hmm. high chances and likelihood to actually invest in those kind of like war in the first place and civil war might actually became worse in their side of the house simply because we think of the ideology of two of these countries but we think that the worst thing is that when it comes to the citizens they're actually being more resilient in the first place and they're getting alienated when there became the migration actually get in in the first place because these people they have different ideology and Paolo note the fact that this is after 1947 which means that these two of these uh, which mean that people come from two of these nations hate each other so badly yeah. 
Should I pass I'll take POI from a uh, uh, closing? Okay, uh, I'll just take a POI then. Yeah, so you keep talking about ideology. Can you please define what difference in ideology exists other than religion? Okay, the difference in ideology exists is that two of these nations, they have different religion in the first place. But why religion still exists differently in today's status quo, but why people do not actually become hate each other like that, is because the British hate tell them something, that when you're actually born into these Indians, you're actually being this specific type of like, you should follow these politicians. For example, in India, they should not follow in Pakistan because Pakistan are really bad people. That is what exactly British tell them in the first place, because they don't want each each other because they don't want two of that country to unify them to become against with British. They want two of these countries to actually against each other and hate each other so the two of these countries couldn't be fight back in the first right. place. That is the different ideology then. But we think a different ideology in here it looks like the fact that in your that, that yeah. um yes I'll take a point then. Uh, do do you think is that yeah, okay. quickly I don't have much time right, so my question is that we have we also have the same ideology countries that are already existing in the world like Somalia and we have seen how drastically they have failed how do you say that your side of the ideology will pass and will be better than Somalia uh, what we have seen already in 1947 as well the difference is, in at least in our side of the house, when we when we push them separately, which means that each uh, each country have their own ideology, would put together and unify with together in the first place. We think that a why is it so much better in your side of the house? One, we think that there's less civil war, but we think two, why in political stability in our side of the house is way more longer and way more secure? Because firstly, when they're unifying, which means they're always going to be have uh, would mean a likelihood for them to have same op sim same opinions and same choices when it comes to politicians and leaders and stuff like that would be way more higher especially when you have the same religion you make higher decision in the first place but even if that there's civil war we think that the civil war in our side of the house is way more solar smaller on a smaller scale and it's way more easier for us to actually control then but talking about like about, about political stability a few mechanism then second of all we think that it's actually became for the same uh, ideology because when humans we have the same ideology we start to believe in each other more and we start to make decisions way more efficiently and quickly compared to your side we think that it's way worse in og then because there are two different parties with two different ideologies yeah. Always going to be fighting against each other in the first place. That is the reason why they have more civil wars. Civil war, yes, we do agree on our worst case exists in our side of the house as OO then. But we think that in OO, it is way more easier to manage compared to their side of the house. Second extension then on the fact that how in our side of the house, when political stability lead to economics then, we think that A, when you're actually, um, we think that political stability lead to economics then, because one, we think that in our side of the house, at least some kind of leaders, they were getting like, at least they're still getting um at least they're still getting some specific type of parties into that into their own nation they don't have to fight to eat for each, they don't have to fight each other to get some specific or to get some main ideology then so they will start focusing more on the uh, on humans and on specifically economics in the first place and we think that, that is so much and more important in your side of the house we think that in og then because they have to have to take more time to unify with each other because consider the fact that they're way more larger scale in terms of uh, civil wars in the first place that is the reason why they don't have much time and energy to focus on economics then why is economic would likely to exist on our side of the house. One, it is way more easier for us to, um, it took less time for us to actually unify opinions together, which means that they have more time, more effort and resources on these economics. Why this economics is so much important in the first place? We think that A, it's live a lot of people and help a lot of citizens in the first place. We think that citizens and immigration inside government wouldn't be able to actually gain some kind of specific benefit in the first place because they're too busy fighting with each other because the citizens themselves in government bench in the first place, they even even if they take in their best case that they yes they live together we don't think that a they would be able to unify with each other because consider the fact that british already teach these people that oh red pakistan or indian people are so bad you could you should unify with each other in the first place and that is the reason why they alien alienate each other within an hour um yeah and my speech thank you thanks so much mg Hello, can I please have 30 seconds? Yeah, sure.
Okay, so before I start, I was just like to ensure that I'm visible and audible to everyone. Also, my BY preferences, uh, you can just use the raise hand reaction and I will offer. But anyway, I will be start. I'm also going to be timing myself and I will be starting my speech in three. First of all, it appears that we will be needing to break down opposition's entire case because there has been a huge emphasis that has been placed upon how the creation of these two different nations led to a prevention of some sort of civil war, right? Was the civil war actually going to happen? We don't really know that for sure. But what do we know for sure? What we know for sure is that the division of the two countries led to further disputes and further conflicts. Like, for example, the Kargil War, for example, the other wars that have occurred between India and Pakistan, for example, uh, an actual civil war within Pakistan that resulted in the creation of Bangladesh, which is, you know, factual in inaccuracy on their part. I don't know how they can come up and say that they prevented a civil war. You know, misconstruing facts is not really the way we should be doing it here, right? And also, this entire theory somehow that a civil war is, you know, built out of religious differences. If that were true, you know, the United States of America has had civil war, but it was not because of differences. So uh, extreme religious differences are not the only, you know, benefactor to having uh, civil war and given that that is completely not exclusive we take that there and again we still have you know ongoing conflict and violence between the two countries the Kashmir issue is still persisting you can't say that you avoided civil war when you've conveniently given birth to so many other conflicts and so many other issues you've conveniently avoided a civil war by dividing the whole region and now that the region are two different countries they're still you know conflicts happening, you just say, oh, since it's not an internal matter anymore, it's not a civil war anymore, which is just inherently stupid, right? Like the entire uh, case that you built about civil wars is wrong. There's also a lot of emphasis on how the two countries or the two, you know, uh, communities would have always continued to fight over religion. Well, before the colonizers ever came to the subcontinent, the region actually had well-established mechanisms to, you know, manage religious diversity. And these different regions were tied together and were economically dependent on each other. And because they had economic and social benefits that they were deriving from each other, they actually had lesser conflict than they would want us to believe, right? And again, this conflict was created because when the two nations were divided, and this was conveniently done by the British because the British colonizers actually had an incentive to keep the two, you know, keep the region weak for their own personal advantages. Like, for example, they wanted to destabilize the region, basically. And this has been touched upon, but I would just like to properly contextualize it. When they left the subcontinent, they wanted to fragment it so that it remained weaker so that they could prevent the rise of, you know, a unified nation that would challenge them or tackle them, right? They also had economic interests. By dividing the subcontinent, they could still actively benefit from influencing their trade routes and their economic policy. They could still leave them dependent on them for, you know, aid and for other kind of support by creating, you know, this entire conflict over regions such as Kashmir, right? Uh, and continue to extract resources and profit from the economic vulnerabilities that they have now created themselves. Number three, the divide and rule uh, style that the British have, right? This was entirely designed by the British colonialists to prevent any unified resistance by creating religious, you know, divisions, which left them incapable of actually dealing with the British and their issues. Before I move on, are there any few eyes? Three? Yeah, I can go Yes. The thing is, in the status quo where they're not even affiliated, they still fight. How is your world? They're completely different, can unify when they do not have nothing in common and is very nascent. Okay. So to answer that, how would our world be different now? Well, first of all, we would not be spending so much money on our military expenditure, dude. Like, 
let's just imagine for one second our constant qualm with you know Pakistan or India as a country is the expenditure that the military gets to spend and the complete dominance that the military has. And why do they have this dominance? They have been given the excuse that there is this ongoing conflict between India and Pakistan, which means that they both must invest in their military more than they invest in the healthcare sector and the educational sector, which keeps their entire economy weakened, which keeps their entire company weakened and dependent on the military, which makes it very easy for them to be manipulated by the military by the West, and this has been done over and over. This was done uh, in Afghanistan. This was done to when they created Taliban, you know, and all these reasons because of which the British or the colonizers continue to profit of this division by exacerbating religious divides that were never that serious to begin with, right? Anyway, we would also have, you know, overall central and regional power, right? Because what you don't realize is that when the two countries were divided, what happened was uh, a lot of, you know, regional instability again, which drained our resources. And how did it impact the economy, right? Negatively. We had a lot of diverse natural resources, trade routes, you know, water bodies, which were then divided between the two regions, which meant that we would not be able to benefit from them the way that we should have originally been able to, right? Which means that we had like significant economic disruptions in our market. We had a divided market, which meant inefficient resource utilization. And, you know, because of that, a lot of people, when the two countries were divided, they either left the country or they relocated, which disrupted the entire development of, you know, a unified educational or scientific community in the region, right? Which led to a loss of actual intellectual capital, right? So when we tell you that if these people had stayed in the country, you know, if we hadn't had this religious, uh, exa exaggerated religious divide leading to the separation of two entire countries, we would have been able to actually spend more on other sectors that would have kept us alive, that would have not existed to serve the main purpose of keeping the colonial powers in power and also just have you know less bloodshed in general never been proud to propose thank you thanks emo um am i perfectly audible yep okay before starting my speech i'm going to take the pos via voice and I'll be taking a POI around maybe 1.30 or towards the end during the fifth minute. So when I ask for the POI, just give the POI then, don't badger on. Starting my, starting my speech in three, two, one. Now, it is really saddening that till now into the entire debate, people are really unable to hold the main issue of the debate, whether it is basically whether it would be wise enough to build up a united federal state in a country with so diverse people, even and especially in India during 1947 with so much tensions already going on. To a great extent, the debate till now was whether civil wars were caused by religion or not, or to a great extent, various teams coming up and explaining the history to me, but I couldn't still get the main content of the many debates. Being in Bangladesh myself and Bangladeshi, knowing the reality of what happened, we're really, really proud to oppose today's motion from our moral perspective too. Realize, in 1947, the communal tensions being really high with significant violence already directed at Muslim Sikhs and Punjabis without partition. Historical records document the several atrocities which are already going on without this partition already. So there is all, there was already a present deep-seated animosity from different religious groups. We do realize that it was due to a large level of communalism and etc. But in such an environment of widespread hatred and division, maintaining a united federal state would have been really unattendable. The dominance of one religion, particularly Hinduism, in the central governance would likely to have led further suppression and oppression in the, of the minority communities, which, can, which we can even see in the status quo. Given these historical and social realities, partition provided a necessary solution to prevent the exacerbating tensions. Now realize that the entire context of the OG is actually partition, which created tensions. It's quite opposite. Partition was actually done to protect the interests of the communities. India as a continent was never truly united and modern Indian identity didn't even exist before it. The opening half was too much fixated on the religion, forgetting all the dynamics. They don't even define what truly they meant by Indian subcontinent. India, Pakistan, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh combined. India, Pakistan, Af Afghanistan, and Nepal together. Which one? Get now, out of this, let's just come into the, and they just claim that people are in peace together in India, but 
let's just see the reality. We can see the atrocities going on Muslims. We can see the atrocities going on in on various minority communities and how peripheral communities and our regions are not getting the attention they require. So they make a lot of false claims too. Now coming to our arguments, number one, why is it a why why whether is there even a common commonality of ground to stay united in USA? There was values. In Japan, it was ethnicity, but India never had a common ground to begin with. Indian subcontinent had always been really diversified with almost people having different ideologies, views, religions, language. Everything is just so much diversified. Diversified. There isn't, there is, is not made, that is not the main, there is no uniting factor here. Only common factor we have been able to identify now is being colonized by the British and sharing history, which does not make a rational Reason, reason to build up a united federal state. Coming to the second argument, let's just say the government mentions hypothetical united federal state. They want this true state, but actually, realistically, it's not going to be the, still the best for the stakeholders. Why? Because realize India has already seen theoretically autonomous states, but they still don't get much benefits under the central government, even in the status quo. The central government cannot reach out to them in the peripheral regions much with infrastructural benefits, nor are they catering to the people in the peripheral region much. That is why the North Indians are having issues with India as the main language. That's why Muslims are facing a lot of suppression internally. Similarly, other minority people in such peripheral regions not only get much, much uh, oppression and suppression and are not getting having a lack of benefits, they're also, they aren't getting that autonomy that was expected and theoretically given to them. They aren't really getting, being heard of. In many cases, they are victims and are being suppressed. Also, if theoretically, the idea of United Federal State was really good to begin with, Muslims won't be accused to be lining with Pakistan. The West Bengalis won't always be accused of lining with Bangladesh. You said there will be geopolitical benefits and we would have much benefits. But it isn't really true, because, isn't really, because like how even in current India, they focus on international benefits while undermining these peripheral, peripheral people to a great extent. I take a POI now. Three, okay, so my two. question is that uh, the, the different the that that Christians that is Christian living in South South India have a different language, have a different uh, culture, and ha have a different religion. While Hindus have a different language and a different religion. Do you okay, think Muslims yes. are the issue? Okay, realize I'm not saying that Muslims are the issue. I'm just saying that there are, you are saying that like if I was in India and my neighbor is Christian and I'm ha I'm uh, staying really peacefully with that person, that is not the debate here. The debate is. Overall, in India, is that person getting much benefits? No, they are still being suppressed overall. It's not about me having no problems or issues staying. It's like overall, I'm being suppressed. Muslims are not being able to, not only Muslims, Christians and also most of the religions are facing suppression, oppression, right? They are not being able to always freely enjoy their religion. They are not getting that freedom to a great extent. So, don't, when, when, if this United Federal State actually happened, India won't be able to cater to all of these people to begin with. This also brings me to my third argument. Various regions and states in India have a strong sense of regional identity and autonomy. States like Tamil Nadu, Punjab, Kashmir have had movements advocating for greater self-governance or even independence. Why are this happening? Because these demands re reflect the deep-rooted regional aspirations that a single federal state might struggle to accommodate. And would highly, highly th I would like to highly thank the government which to have accepted the fact that religions, religious differences exist and it is hard to accommodate all of them together, which I've seen from both of the government benches. But it is really weird that they are claiming that people are staying really happily in India despite of this difference of religions. That is where, that is where we add to the entire opening half, especially OO and also T. Now, coming to the burdens, the burden of the government bench was to prove why these people in the peripheral regions need to cater to, how the current minority or mainstream religions are catered to would be catered to in their world, on what basis they are going to unite them, how would you have reduced these tensions and allowed them to protect their self interest, etc. How they would, how are they going to justify that while even in current India, the central government and Hindus dominated India back then, while ongoing tensions were going on. How would you implement these autonomous regions and United Federal State? All these mechanisms essential for this debate never came from the entire government bench. And I believe that's why the opposition bench, especially we win the debate. Current rebuttals realize the government is saying these communal hatred are because of the government are because the government argues that communal tensions result from the partition and suggests that these could have been avoided if the partition have never offered. However, it is crucial to recognize that the partition was a necessary measure to protect the distinct communities yeah, from potential yeah. operation. It's a protected time. The subsequent conflicts, like Bangladesh Liberation War, while tragic, are not central to today's debate. The partition provided a framework that helped prevent further suppression of people, what now see. But still, 
tensions are going on in India. The notion that diverse re region, religions could have been peacefully coexisting in a united India is unrealistic given the status quo. Regarding resource allocation, the promise that a united state would better manage resources is flawed. Historically, peripheral regions in India have always faced inadequate resource distribution, a problem that continues still today. And we come out of this utopian bubble the entire government bench has created in this debate and extend this debate much more beyond the constraint contextualization of the opening opposition, adding layers on how the status quo proves the implausibility of the United Federal State for India and how it would never be plausible, possible, and it would be illogical to begin with in terms of weighing to. Thank you. I'd like to end my speech here. Thanks. Reminder again to keep track of other people's time so you know when the predicted time begins and ends. Talk Um, we, uh, can you just give me 30 seconds, please? Sure. Can I ask Ash to actually just message when it's six minute mark so we cannot ask you guys in that? No, uh, I cannot because we are noting down the debate and have to pay attention to it. You can just keep track of time yourselves. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, let me just set up my timer. Can you just confirm if I'm audible and visible in the meantime? Yep, you are. Okay, let me just set up my timer then. Mm -hmm. Are we starting in are we starting in three, two, one? Panel, please note that opposition is constantly propagating division, right? That ignoring the long-term effects such as regional tensions and conflicts. And please note that their world is simply the status quo that we currently live in, right? Government keeps emphasizing these long-term benefits such as stability, economic growth, and reduced conflict while the opposition focuses on uh, on short-term avoidance of civil war right but the long-term stability and economic potential of a unified subcontinent presents a much stronger case uh, uh, with a for a much stronger case and with that being said said i would just like to pose a very simple question for opposition how exactly do you then justify the suppression minorities face in the status quo due to the propagation of this exact belief this extremism right in our world we actually wear towards unlearning this harmful belief right before moving on to my clashes and comparisons it's very important to like context recontextualize this debate which has been done by my uh first speaker as well but i would just like to reiterate some of her points understand that the history of the subcontinent is very uh, very important and should be considered in this debate right the subcontinent has a history of colonization and this is important to note because the british had the incentive to break up the subcontinent and create the white white divide why exactly is that so it's because this uh Divide and rule, which my first speaker talked about extensively, is a political tactic that is used by countries to take control over areas. And how exactly they achieve that, uh, and how exactly they achieve that, it is by over exaggeration of religious and cultural differences. And because when people of a country fight amongst themselves, it is a lot easier to intervene in their policies and um, and disrupt their own power structures, right? Now, a few general reputations that I had uh, regarding the closings. Uh, closing opposition speech is that first of all they talked about how there is no common ground or uniting factor which i personally find is a very weird argument because then like if you use that argument then you could also say that secular states should theoretically just not work but it but exactly we think that diversity was never really a problem the british and the colonizers weaponizing it against the our people was right but also they talked about how these people how uh, pakistanis and indians and the regions that regions that uh, exist within these countries have uh, these people have a strong regional identity but then again by using your own justifications should we be dividing these small regions these small provinces as well right so now um we uh now the importance 
Uh, okay, wait, I'm so sorry. Now moving on to my classes before I do that, are there any POIs? Opening POI. Yes, please. First, more civil wars means more killing, which is 10 times more than migration number. Two, a, a newborn government does not have the money, neither the incentive to mediate any kind of conflicts like what you just said. Okay, uh, this is something that I will be just uh, like discussing ex extensively in my classes, uh, so it will answer your question there. So now let's talk about this very important idea that was discussed in, uh, extensively, which was dividing extremism, right? So what opening opposition told us is that religious hostility sparks war and conflict, right? And they said that Pakistan and India and India are very reliant on religious uh, religion to the extent that it is integrated within their politics as well. Two responses to that: number one, the the uh, opening opposition seems to be ignorant of the important context that the subcontinent was colonized and the British weaponized their religion and culture against them to maintain control. But number two, currently, uh, the religion, like religion is so predominant in Indian and Pakistani politics because these ideas are still being propagated and have been propagated throughout history leading to this extremism that currently exists in both countries. And we should be instead working on unveiling these values, which would have happened if the subcontinent remained a united state, right? Then they talked about, uh, the, again, this also addresses um, the POI about uh, civil unrest based on religious differences, right? Again, this is untrue because a, a secular state will actually will better protect religious minorities since policies will be built in that way and not in favor of a single religion as they are right now. Right. What we tell you is that the civil uh, civil unrest exists uh, exists currently in both countries where they, uh, it's just currently in the status quo as well the way that they, they are arguing for the religious minorities are uh, mistreated. OG obviously attempted to address this and they talked about communal tensions in the partition and how there will be better diversity on outside of the world. But what we told you is that we, can, uh, we explained the historical context of divide and rule and how it is important to understand the nature of colonialism and how they aim to weaken the country by preventing unification. And we also told you about the two nation theory that exists because of divide and rule which is a political tool that was used by the British and we dismantled the exact premise of the two nation theory itself and posed the question that what exactly led to the creation of Bangladesh then if it was just religion right but now weighing our arguments right comparing both harms in both worlds in government's best case their best case is just the status quo that currently exists and what it looks like is a religious divide it looks like certain religious identities feeling more entitled to their country and uh, it also looks like minorities constantly being sidelined and further divide being created based on identity. For example, Baloch in Pakistan or Pashtuns in Pakistan even, right? But then another important idea that we discussed is economy, right? Oji did not really engage with any of the arguments about any economic impacts the partition had. But what opening opposition told us, is, and we think is very interesting, interesting, is that economic interests are better protected on their side of the world as the government will be more focused on development rather than civil unrest. Um, three responses to that. Number one, civil, civil unrest still exists, and there exists a lot of extremism. Burning of, uh, and examples of that extremism are burning of Christian colonies in Pakistan, Balochas being displaced, Muslim Indians being mistreated. So we do not really understand how they're uh, really like saving money of that if it like still exists in their world right but number two on top of that on top of the civil unrest on their side of the world we now also have security threats from each other and if the, the proof of that is that so much budget of both countries is being allocated purely to defense right instead and instead could have been used for uh, economic development right but even if we believe that somehow there is better economic development on their side of the world a unified subcontinent would mean benefiting off of numerous natural resources that have been divided due to partition right so on our side of the world there are more di diverse natural resources important trade routes that can be exploited for economic benefit and would have obviously not been possible on their side of the world but uh, moreover we also told you about the global status and standing and how that would have been better uh, better if the um, partition never happened but that is something they never engaged with and for all of those reasons and for all of the much broader impacts that we brought into this argument we think that we clearly take the case thank you so much great thanks open am i clearly audible yep you are i will start my speech shortly let me just set my personal timer
before I start my speech, my POI preferences are strictly via chat. With all the that being said, I'm starting my speech in three, two, one. The in problem with every single site so far is that one, their hyper fixation on religion as this sole issue that exists and that exists to divide South Asia or the Indian subcontinent in general. Furthermore, they also assume that Broadly speaking, South Asians or in, people in the Indian subcontinent have the same exact culture. And this is more specific to the government side, but they live in this very delusional world where they only focus on this potential and possibility whilst ignoring the reality, both within the status quo and also within the historical context. One of the, let's move right into rebuttals. One of the overarching claims, in fact, the primary overarching claim of the government side was that, hey, historically speaking, the South, the Indian subcontinent was very strong, very influential. And if it was united even now, it would basically be the same. It would still be strong. It would still be influential. And it's going to be great for everyone. Everyone is going to be united. But this premise is entirely false. Because when you're talking about this hypothetical united South Asia or Indian subcontinent, what exactly are you referring to within the historical context? Are you talking about the Mughal Empire, which systematically discriminated against Hindus? Are you talking about the Mauryan Empire, which was basically the textbook definition of an empire that progressively tries to colonize literally every single country in its vicinity. Are you talking about the Maratha Empire, which is much much the same as the Mauryan Empire? What exactly are you talking about? And do you not address any of these issues whatsoever? Furthermore, even when, when uh, South Asia wasn't broadly united under some empire, such as the Maratha Empire or the Mauryan Empire or the Mughal Empire, when South Asia was divided, which was true for a significant portion, I would even say the majority of South Asia's history or Indian subcontinent's history, that is that the entire region was united, sorry, divided based on ethnic lines. You had kingdoms for Bengalis, empires for Marathis and Punjabis, etc. They were constantly at a state of war. They never liked each other. You need to understand one of the main reasons India was colonized in the status quo in the first place. Why was that the case? Because the British had their first ever foothold, their stranglehold over Bengal. That's what they used as a sort of launching point for the invasion and conquest of the entire subcontinent. And the only reason they were able to defeat and subjugate Bengal was prior to their battle with Bengal, the Marathas invaded parts of Bengal. They committed systematic atrocities. They significantly weakened Bengal. They also harmed the political fabric of Bengal. There are many such examples of these cases of states constantly fighting each other and committing atrocities against each other. The truth is these states were never meant to be united because here's the thing, you cannot just lump a bunch of ethnicities and nations together into just one nation state because India is not a nation. Indian is not a nation. It's just a concept that arised in the 20th century, mainly due to British colonization. Do you really think that someone yeah. from the Mughal Empire would identify themselves as Indian? No. Uh, they... So within the historical context, you completely fail. They also say that, hey, the state is going to be secular and impartial. And uh, as a result, there's, there won't be any discrimination. But that's actually not guaranteed because here's the thing. When you have such a big and diverse nation, naturally, the largest plurality is going to be the one that has the largest share of power. And in the hypothetical United Indian subcontinent, that largest plurality are going to be Hindi speaking Hindus. All it really takes is just one uh, populist politician to rally the masses behind a Hindu nationalist cause or a North Indian nationalist cause, which is inherently exclusionary and discriminatory in yeah. nature. And boom, there you have it, an exclusionary and discriminatory state, which is exactly what we see in India in the current status quo. And in the scenario of a hypothetical united Indian subcontinent, this is going to be an even bigger issue because it's much more diverse, it's much larger, it has even more peripheral regions, it has more movements against the central government, it has much more complexities and nuances to it. And this was a problem for literally every single other side in this entire debate. They yeah. failed to engage with the... I'm not taking POIs by voice. They fail to engage with the nuances regarding the differences about between South Asians or people of the Indian subcontinent because they do not exist solely based on religion. There's different ethnicities, there's different races, etc. They also say that, hey, in a hypothetical scenario, uh, we are going to have a federation and it's going to work. It's, it's just going to be like the United States or the European Union. Let me address the Example of the United States first. The US has the same, broadly the same language that they all speak. They have a 
probably the same set of values that everyone adheres to, and that is why they are united. You cannot say the same for the entirety of South Asia. About the European Union, the right in the euro, right in Europe, which is progressively rising in power, they are completely against this idea of a united Europe. And as a result, we see that this idea of the united Europe and a united European Federation is slowly but surely losing support, no longer having traction. They also talk about various different problems that exist in the current status quo, like Bangladesh, Kashmir, and ask us how these were still possible in our world. But here's the thing, I'll get to that in a second, but let me first show you why the existence of Bangladesh actually proves our side and our case more. You see, Bangladesh was coupled with Pakistan because they had one commonality. That thing was religion. This kept them united for almost two and a half dec decades before the government was just the right mix of autocracy, ex autocratic, exclusionary, and weak for the people of Bangladesh to fight and win. In your world, a hypothetical India would be much larger, more diverse, and more polarized. There are going to be Bengalis in the East, Punjabis in the West, Tamils and Telugus in the South, uh, Hindi-speaking, Hindi-speaking Hindus in the north, as well as Kashmiris in Kashmir. There's going to be different races like Dravidians, Indo-Aryans, potentially even Sino-Tibetan and Central Asian groups. So it's going to be much more diverse and inherently much more polarized. Even in the context of current India, which is much less diverse than this hypothetical country, we already see that there are so many different separatist movements because these people want self-determination. And in this hypothetical scenario, it's going to be even worse because the largest plurality, which I've already established, would likely be the North Indian Hindus, Hindi-speaking Hindus. They're going That's to nice. have to expend more, no, I'm not taking POIs. They're going to have to expend more resources to sort of systematically suppress a larger and more numerous, diverse amount of peripheral regions than what they already do. And as a result, it's likely going to be much more bloody. It's going to be con more costly for the entire subcontinent as a whole. And as a result, it's going to be bad for everyone. So at the end of the day, what we see is that what we have in the current status quo may not be perfect, but it is still much better than the absolute nightmare that would exist if we just arbitrarily lumped nearly 2 billion people together on the sole basis that, hey, they exist in broadly in the same region or they were colonized by the same power and have literally no other commonality other than that. And with that, I would like to conclude my speech. Very proud to oppose. Great, thanks all for um, our round. Um, congrats again on making the finals. I think now what um, would be useful is if uh, everyone except the judges leave the um, room so that we can deliberate.